is the illustrator. So, in Isaiah 39, before Isaiah 40, where this comes up, King Hezekiah in Isaiah 39 has generally not been a bad king along the way. He's been okay. Uh, good chap. But he receives emissaries from Babylon. And they come along uh, and he rather vaingloriously shows off to the envoys from the king of Babylon everything you know, that shows of his greatness and his all the things God's given him he makes himself look big about. Then Isaiah, along comes the prophet, a difficult thing when the prophet comes along, he's going to be asking all good questions. All right, the prophet comes along, and Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord Almighty. The time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your predecessors have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood, who will be born to you, will be taken away, and they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Now, that's terrible. He's come along and he said, what have you done, Hezekiah? And Hezekiah says, I've been showing them everything. Yeah, I'm showing them how great it all is. And he says, oh, you muppet, you should not have done that. Now what's going to happen is that everything's going to be taken away and your descendants, your own descendants will be taken off and they'll become eunuchs in the court of the king of Babylon. Every, terrible things are going to happen. That should make Hezekiah quake because of what he had done. But the man has become so self-centred, so lacking in any gentle care for his people, for his family, for his own flesh and blood, soon to be carried off for unspeakable things to happen to him in Babylon. The word of the Lord you've spoken is good, Hezekiah replied. For he thought there will be peace and security in my time. Now there's the immediate background to Isaiah 40. Look at the shape of it. It's on the screen for this reason. So on the left-hand side, I've put comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Proclaim to her that her hard service is completed, her sins have been paid for. God has been gentle. But on the right-hand side, then, you get this strong voice. The glory of the Lord will be revealed. All people will see it. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. There's that strong authority and sovereignty in God. And then... On the other side, a voice says, cry out, what shall I cry? The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. His encouragement and gentleness being shown. And then on the other side, uh, you know, you go up on a high mountain, shout, lift up, say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. Strength, you see. The sovereign Lord comes with power. He rules with his mighty arm. And then it says, his reward is with him. There's this flipping back and forth from the strong to the gentle in God. And look how it finishes in verse 11 of Isaiah 40. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms, carries them close to his heart, gently leads those that have young. Gently. There's his strength with his gentleness. Not set up as opposites. No way in opposition or in contradiction. But as things that are different but work together and you get it as, as almost as if he is the one who can be gentle because he is the one who is strong we've been saying you know you need to be strong to be able to be gentle it's strength that often needs to be addressed when people are not gentle enough it's restoring strength and that's an issue we need to be pretty much aware of. There's a tie-up right back to the 8th century BC in Isaiah between the strength and the gentleness of God. We need to see that if we, if we are to grasp what gentleness is in Scripture. The gentleness of God is not weakness. It is as the fruit of His Spirit, living in all those, those who walk by the Spirit, that His fruit grows on us. There's a gentleness that comes with strength. Not weakness comes out of his strength. Isaiah has illustrated that. And you know, it's this idea again that you need a truly strong person to be truly gentle. And God seems to be the best illustration. So um, here's another illustration, a bit of poetry. Can you cut a bit of poetry now quickly? It's only a short quote from Longfellow, right? Longfellow's got this poem about the village blacksmith, which I remember from dim and distant days. 
and things we had to get dragged through in school. Cal, we didn't have contemporary poems in my day, good heavens no, it was all stuff you couldn't grasp the language of. But here it goes, the main character in this poem, the village blacksmith, right? The smith, a mighty man is he, with large and sinewy hands, and the muscles of his brawny arms are strong as iron bands. Poems also used to rhyme, which was also a good thing, yeah? That was great, you remember it better. The smith, the mighty man is he, with large and sinewy hands, and the muscles of his brawny arms are strong as iron bands. And then he goes on, and, and you see the blacksmith in church. And in church he hears his daughter singing a hymn, and this big, strong lump of a guy is overcome with emotion. And with his hard, rough hand he wipes a tear out of his eyes. Now that's gentleness. Strength restrained, humility and grace. So let's not mistake this. It is strength that allows a person to be gentle. 